keep your heart wide open though the waves wanna push you around mm, you gotta keep your heart wide open till your faith brings you back to solid ground mm, I'm, gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide open though these waves wanna push though they want me around though the waves wanna push me around I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide open till my faith brings me back brings me back to solid ground till my faith brings me back to solid ground we gotta keep we gotta keep our heart we gotta keep wide open we gotta keep our hearts wide open though these waves wanna put us around though these waves we wanna keep don't you know around. we gotta keep we gotta keep our hearts we gotta keep, gotta keep wide open our hearts are open till our faith brings us back brings us back to solid ground till our faith brings us back to solid ground stronger than our pain we are greater than our fear we are made of each i am and we choose and we choose where we stand we don't you love no pain and we are Stop. 
start of any given day. There is mystery available. There is a game waiting for an open heart to say yes. Here I am, I'll play. And if we're smart, we'll listen to the way and all the misery that held us down. We'll let it fade, let it be outshined by a simple spark of a life that's waiting to be made. It's waiting to be of this day what will you keep what will you change what will you see what will you believe what will you make of your dreams will you keep sleeping or will you awake and then decide what you will make start of any given day there is history and poetry there is a play but you're not in the audience you are the star so get out there and say what Welcome. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our first ever Maryland Sierra Club virtual benefit event for Women's History Month and World Poetry Day today. Uh, what a wonderful combination, and um, thank you for um, all of your contributions to the, our opening because um, the music and art and um, beauty and um, in all of your contributions um, make this movement really special. So I am going to be your host this evening. My name is Rosa Hans. I'm the chapter chair of the Maryland Sierra Club. And um, hello to all of you who I know and love and cherish. And hello to all of my new friends uh, who are joining on this Zoom meeting format. Um, it's great to see you all here, and someday we'll do this in person, but um, the beautiful thing about this is that we can participate from all different parts of Maryland simultaneously, so that makes it pretty fun. Um, thank you for using the chat already, and if you haven't already, drop a line in the chat of uh, who you are and where you're zooming in from. Um, and the thank yous uh, continue to all of the speakers that you're going to hear from tonight, Delegate Brooke Learman, Dr. Rose Brucefero. Um, we have uh, Rabbi Nina Beth Cardin with us this evening, um, Eco Latino CEO and founder of Ruby Semmel, and our poet of Baltimore, recently published in All We Can Save, Ailish Hopper, and the Environmental Justice Co-Chair of the NAACP Maryland State Conference and Prince George's Branch, Stacey Hartwell. And last but certainly not least, because she is going to kick us off um, in the uh, next part of our program, uh, a group chair. In fact, we have two wonderful group chairs of the Maryland chapter who are um, a part of our program and Shruti Padmakar is the Montgomery County Group Chair, and she's going to start us off. And then um, Spice, uh, Deborah Kleinman, is going to sing us out at the ending. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you, for making this evening so special. And there are so many VIP attendees in this room. I could spend all day just listing your names. So <laughs> let, let us begin first with an acknowledgement of the land that we are on. I am. Here in, uh, I live in St. Mary's County, Southern Maryland, the ancestral homeland of Piscataway peoples. And even 
though um, the Piscataway peoples have only recognized um, Native Indigenous um, tribal um, entity that is recognized in the state of Maryland, they are certainly not the only first peoples who've lived on our land. And so I want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the people who have come before us on this land and um, and and think of them as we start a moment of silence. Um, in addition, um, this year has been so um, long that we could we could stay silent for all of the over 500,000 um, Americans who have been lost during the pandemic. And also, um, most recently, though, for the six Asian American women um, who were sens senselessly um, killed in a brutal attack. And so um, before we begin, um, I would like us to take a moment of silence um, before we go on. Thank you for joining me. So, thank you all. And um, let me turn things over to Shruti Bhaknagar, who will kick us off. Thank you so much, Shruti. Thank you so much, Rosa, and good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to see such a great turnout today. And um, Rosa, thank you so much for organizing this forum. I wanted to start off by introducing Rosa Hans, who was elected chair of the Sierra Club Maryland in 2020. Prior to that, Rosa served as the chapter vice chair for 2019 after serving two years as the chair of Southern Maryland Sierra Club. In these roles, she has helped bring increased focus on community coalition building and emphasize the importance of demographic and ideological diversity in sustaining a strong environmental movement. A former Spanish teacher at a high needs high school, Rosa has also spent time as a manager at a local maritime history museum in St. Mary's County. And as an activist continues to engage in environmental projects and advocacy in her local community. Rosa is a native New Yorker from Long Island and lives in Southern Maryland. She enjoys exploring the outdoors with her family and two children, Luke and Emmy. So uh, thank you again, Rosa. I think this is such an important conversation. I want to um, mention the quote that was on the slide that I shared earlier, which is equity and inclusion are indispensable requirements for sustainable development and addressing climate change that disproportionately impacts people of color, minorities, and those who face multiple systems of oppression. To make true progress to a sustainable world, we must address inequity, be inclusive, and empower those most impacted and disfranchised. It is critical to recognize that everyone benefits when those that are most vulnerable thrive. In many of the discourses that have shaped the way that sustainable development is approached, women have become more integrated and critical in shaping these ideas and conversations. So it is my pleasure today to introduce our first guest, Delegate Brooke Learman, who represents District 46 in the Maryland House of Delegates since 2015. She is a mother of two and a disability and civil rights attorney. After spending five years as a member of the Appropriations Committee in the General Assembly, she assumed a leadership role on the Environment and Transportation Committee in 2019. She also sits on the Joint Committee on Ending Homelessness, the Oversight Committee on Pensions, and founded and co-chairs the Maryland Transit Caucus. Brooke has been a lifelong organizer and as a community advocate, always been an active participant in her community and across Baltimore to promote thriving neighborhoods. Brooke, welcome to the program, and I'm so excited and honored to introduce you today. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti, my friend. You are so amazing um, and such a leader in so many ways, as are so many of the people on this uh, Zoom tonight. What a wonderful way to end the first weekend of spring with all of you here um, tonight. I wish we were in person and someday we will be soon, I think. Um, so, but it's just great to see all of you. So thank you. It's just an honor to be with you. And I, 
I promise I won't take too long. I wanted to start off with the Lorax. Um, I was reading it last night to my daughter who just came up to say goodnight, uh, if you saw her. And, you know, it just sticks with me. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. You are all the people who are caring so much. And for that, I am really, really grateful. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I like to remind myself is that each of us has a role to play, right, in the sustainability movement, in the environmental movement, the earth justice movement, you know, whether that's becoming a vegetarian or becoming a leader with Sierra Club or running for office or leading community cleanups or investing your money in, you know, clean mutual funds. I think there are just so many ways that each of us can work on this issue of creating a more sustainable and just environment and planet uh, for future generations. So I am always humbled and, and honored to be able to work with, uh, with all of you and folks in the Sierra Club because of the incredible time commitment and the dedication that you have to this work. Um, I am very grateful. You know, um, so when I arrived in Annapolis, I, I say this because I think it's important that you understand just how powerful you can be when I arrived in Annapolis, you know, I cared a lot about environmental issues generally, but, you know, as a freshman legislator, I didn't have a, an agenda yet or anything. I didn't know what bills I was going to bring. And my first day, so opening day in Annapolis, I was going to walk into the house office building and a woman who looked about my age opened the door for me and said, hi, my name's Julie Lawson. I started a group called Trash Free Maryland and I'd like you to sponsor a bill for me. And I was like, hi, you seem nice. I don't, you know, tell me what the bill is. What is it? And she was like, can I walk with you? And I was like, sure. So she walked me down the hall and she said, I'd like you to sponsor a plastic bag ban. And let me tell you about it. And basically all she had to say was a plastic bag ban. And I was like, done, I'm in. I hate plastic bags. Like I'm happy to sponsor it. And we worked together that year. And you know, you know, you all know we were not successful. So eventually we moved over to styrofoam, which of course we were successful with your help, which was really exciting, becoming the first state in the country to ban uh, styrofoam food and beverage containers. And now more and more states are following our lead, which is great to see. But it was really, she asked, right? She came and talked to me and that made all the difference, right? She could have gone to other people, I know, and it was an honor that she chose me, but really, you know, I learned so much from her and from you uh, and the people like Lindsay, like Josh, like Shruti and, and Rosa and others who I work with, um, because you bring your knowledge base and your expertise and you say, hey, there's also, you know, there are these problems that we're facing, like, would you be willing to work on these issues? And it's just, there are so many things coming at us as legislators all the time that your ability to help us focus on some of these huge, huge existential crises and how legislation that we can pass can help some of those challenges in our own way that I just can't tell you how important and how powerful that is. So um, just a huge thank you to, to you for the work you do. I'll say a couple, another, uh, another example of the importance of your role and your leadership. Um, I was on the appropriations committee for many years and I served on the environment and transportation subcommittee. And so we had oversight responsibilities for the Maryland Department of Environment and Maryland Department of Transportation and DNR and all the environmental agencies. And I started working with Sierra Club and LCV leaders and, and others, frankly, to because what we realized was that every year of this administration, we were seeing less and less enforcement. And we, it was all anecdotal at first. We had a lot of water keepers talking about this too. And so what we realized was we needed more data. And so using my perch from the appropriations committee, we were able to first question the, D, the MDE secretary, DNR secretary, Maryland Department of the Agriculture secretary about what enforcement they were doing of our clean water and clean air laws. And when we weren't getting satisfactory answers, we started putting in budget language and requiring quarterly reporting <laughs> from all of these agencies to demonstrate to us what they were actually doing to enforce these laws. And what we saw was that they were doing almost anything, that every year of the administration, we have seen fewer enforcement actions than the year before. And we are now seeing fewer enforcement actions than in the history of our clean water and clean air laws in Maryland. 
Um, and gathering that data was so important because we were then able to put together what we think will hopefully be a big a, a solution. Um, while we can't change our MDE secretary and we can't hire more enforcement agents, we can put together um, a more transparent government. So we have a bill in this year, HB 204, to create more working with Senator Sarah Elfreth as well uh, to create more transparency so that our water keepers and outside uh, advocates can work with MDE and DNR to hold them responsible so that we are ultimately holding polluters responsible so that our clean water laws aren't just words on paper but they're actually living breathing um, and enforced ideas. And then finally, of course, transit. It's been a real journey uh, working with groups on transit and it's been such a thrill. You know, Just this past week, we passed a huge bill to help save MTA, frankly. Um, uh, and that has been such a thrill to work with Lindsay on since such a leader and such a great organizer. Um, you know, From the moment that we've started working together, it's been a, a long journey, but we're getting there. And you know, I feel, just so happy to see and so thrilled to see transit become part of the central environmental narrative in the state of Maryland. We know that the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions are automobiles and cars and our transportation sector. And that means we have to get real on transit. And if we have a system that's breaking down all the time, which we do right now, no one wants to take it. So there's no need, to, so there's no reason that folks will take it. And so we have to shore it up and we have to invest in it. And so it's just been such an honor to work with so many of you on building up our transit system. So I know I don't have too long and I want to, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just wanted to really say thank you to all of you uh, for the work that you're doing. I'm blessed to work with so many amazing leaders in the legislature like Maggie McIntosh, Regina Boyce, Laura, Sarah, Dina, Sarah Elfreth, Cheryl Kagan, and others. I couldn't do the work. None of us though could do this work without support from, from you. Um, so a huge thank you. When I think about the future of the moment, movement, I know it's you um, and folks in our own communities, like the folks in, who, who started Free Your Voice in Curtis Bay in my district, and I'm just excited to continue this work. So uh, I'll just end with my favorite quote from the Perkia vote. We are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are we free to desist from it. So I look forward to continuing to persist in this work with all of you. Thank you. Well, Brooke, very well said. Thank you so much for your leadership in the General Assembly and the amazing work that you are doing. There were a lot of compliments in the chat for you, and we really appreciate you taking the time today to share uh, this information with us today. So with that, I pass it on to Rosa. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shruti, and thank you, Brooke. Uh, you brought so much, and uh, you have a lot of cheerleaders out here. We're, we're rooting for you. You've got a uh, a really good batting average with uh, the bills that you're working on this uh, season in the General Assembly, and we're, we're, we're counting and, and rooting for you. Um, so with that, let's turn over to our next guest, Dr. Rose Bruce Afero, who is joining us from Baltimore City this evening. And um, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Rose introduce herself um, and, and share a little bit about Backyard Base Camp, um, which you've uh, started and, and been there from the beginning and um, has a really bright future ahead. Thank you, Rosa. I'm really honored to be here tonight. Sierra Club is one of the organizations that you dream of um, getting into the inner circle. <laughs> so I um, started, I got into the sustainability field by way of environmental education 10 years ago in 2011. I was studying biology and in the last year of school, you have to do um, some independent studies. So I went to our local nature center and was invited into our nature preschool and fell in love with the pedagogy um, and that year I studied environmental literacy in children and then I went on to do a master's in environmental science and I studied the sustainability of nature play spaces and that is when I started hearing about sustainability because I started um, studying biology thinking I wanted to take care of wildlife but then I understood to do that you have to take care of the ecology in which they live 
And then even further, even bigger, larger picture is the idea of sustainability. So when I was searching for a doctorate program, I found Prescott College uh, limited residency PhD in sustainability education. And so I just graduated last April. Wow, it's been a year. Um, and um, during the program, I met Atia Wells, who is the executive director of Backyard Base Camp. Um, and she and I became fast friends because I had this idea of a business plan that would be to build what I call an ecological demonstration site. And Tia had just found some land on which she was hoping to build a community nature hub. So we had the same idea back in 2018. And then finally in 2019, Backyard Base Camp became a real thing. So I would like to show you a couple slides to tell you who we are and what we do. We're just three people. <laughs> um, just these three people, Atia Wells is our executive director. I am the program specialist and Jordan Bethia is our farm manager. Um, we live in Baltimore City. You can see on the west side, there's a lot of green space that is well maintained by city government. And then on the east side where we are is more sparse. Um, and we, if you zoom in, you'll see this sliver of land is here. And then we are right here where the star is. This little patch of green space is an abandoned um, urban forest patch. In 1976, Morris Goldsecker owned this piece of land and wanted to develop it into homes, but didn't do it. And so he donated it to the city of Baltimore and they called it Barber and Parkwood Park, but then they abandoned it and it became overgrown. So um, Tia and all of us, all three of the Backyard Base Camp crew, we live in this neighborhood. And so Tia one day was walking through the forest and she came out in this abandoned lot here and she found that lot and decided she wanted to turn it into an urban farm. So this is our concept plan of that. Um, the first thing we did, the first thing that Tia did was to get a land lease with the landowner. And then she found the homeowners and raised money to buy the house. So the landowner eventually donated the land to Backyard Base Camp and, they, and we own this home. So now we have three acres of urban farm with the potential to have some office space. But this three acres backs up to public land that is Barber and Parkwood Park. So we became a friends of group so that we can steward the park and make it accessible to the community. So big part of my responsibility is making trails and creating nature play spaces and putting an outdoor classroom inside this public urban green space. I'm gonna, this is part of, actually, let me even skip faster ahead because all I have time to tell you about are the um, Backyard Base Camp is all about reconnecting urban communities with nature in their own backyards because we know from experience that it is sometimes more effective to help our communities get comfortable being outside in their own um, comfort zones before you send them to a national park and ask them to sleep in the woods. So all of the programming that we do is culturally relevant and culturally responsive. And Bliss Meadows, the urban farm project is able to focus on five pillars of environmental justice and they are here. Um, animal husbandry means that we have, we have chickens, goats, a bunny, and we are um, going to have a sheep this summer and some beehives. And the idea is to show Baltimore City residents that you can have your own eggs and milk and things of that nature in, in the city. And we are going to teach you how to do it and how to maintain it and what kinds of regulations go along with that.
We also do community green space. So that just means that even though we own three acres of land and we are stewards of seven more acres, the whole 10 acre project belongs to the community. And we do conservation as one of our five pillars because there are many conservation opportunities in particular community science projects in which we can ask the community what kinds of things in nature are important to you and how can we protect them? Like, would you like to come count butterflies? Would you like to put up bird boxes? What can we do for you that would matter? Environmental education and justice. Um, I mentioned the way that we approach this and that we have found is lacking in some in the experiences that we have with nature based organizations is that we make sure environmental education is culturally relevant to our audience because in Frankfurt, the majority of our demographics are black and brown families. So if we're going to teach you about seeds, we're also going to teach you about how our ancestors braided seeds into their hair to get over to, to preserve that part of our culture as we were brought over, um, things of that nature. And then the last is food access. So that is an, um, something that was exacerbated by coronavirus. Um, and um, last spring, one of the first things we were able to do for our communities was to go door to door and give free 10 pound boxes of produce to our neighbors um, be through, through a, a partnership with city agencies. So it's a very big project. <laughs> it's so much I could talk about and tell you about. Um, but if you do have questions, I will gladly take them in the chat and maybe have to email you later on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rose. I see the chat is like blowing up with excitement. I mean, when I when I heard you speak and explain this first, I was like, we I we need to get to know you. Like this is this is wonderful work that you're doing and it's inspiring to all of us. So yes, everyone, you know, reach out and, and put your info in the chat and maybe if you can share your email with folks in the chat then they can contact you directly as well. Great. I'll Thank you that. so much for coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, so next up let me pass um, over to Shruti because you know I, I feel like the we're talking about uh, Rose you're talking about the environmental justice principles and it's so um, I love the way that you're centering your work um, and living those principles. And our next guest, I think um, Shruti and Nina will probably be um, reflecting on this as well, that the environmental, our environmental rights is not separate from human rights, is not separate from civil rights, it's all interconnected and intertwined. So um, thank you for, for being a living example and you know, to us all an inspiration of how to, um, how to do things really beautifully. So thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Um... It is now my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Nina Beth Garden, who is the co-founder and director of the Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights. She has been involved in the environmental advocacy for more than 15 years and served in many leadership roles. Ordained as a rabbi in 1988 from the Jewish Theological Seminary, she has served mm -hmm. in that institution in several capacities. Oh, it is such an honor to introduce you today. I was reading an article that you wrote in, uh, correct me if my pronunciation isn't correct, but Let Lekha Environmental Refugees, and uh, in which you have mentioned that in caring for the land, we care for each other. And regrettably, large scale environmental dislocation based on mistreatment of the earth has already begun. That article touched me on so many levels and I would like to um, ask you what inspires you and drives you and can you speak to the overlap between the sustainability movement and the movement for human rights? Thank you for having me here. Um, thank you to Sierra Club. Um, 
I can't believe I have to follow Rose because that was such an inspiring presentation. The one thing that I can say is that I did hear Rose once before in an equity workshop and you were fabulous then too. And I am delighted that an organization that I helped found a couple of years ago, the Bottom Orchard Project is going to be planting with you in the very near future. So um, that's really fabulous. So, um, and thank you, Rosa, for, for inviting me. Um, so what inspires me, you know, uh, Thomas Berry, who was a, a Catholic theologian, wrote several things that moved me immensely. I, I'm, I must say that several years ago, 15 years ago or so, when I was you know, gainfully employed in a full-time job, which was the last time I was gainfully employed in a full-time job, um, I, I became very unhappy with the engagement or the lack of engagement by the faith community in sustainability issues and environmental issues. So I did the hasty thing of um, quitting my job and saying, I have to throw my efforts um, and the, so really the rest of my life into getting the faith community and then others also focused on sustainability. Well, a lot has happened in the last 15 years, thank goodness. But I read so about 10 years ago or so, Thomas Berry, this Catholic theologian who said two things that were stunning to me. One, he said, every generation has a great work that they're called to do. This great work that we're called to do, even if we're not, um, we didn't choose it, it was thrust upon us by history. So each generation has this great work and our great work, our great work is the sustainability of the earth. And I, I take that very seriously. That is if we all know that we are the last generation that can do anything to really stop this runaway greenhouse gases and the runaway climate change to help preserve the earth as much as we can the way that I was given it when I was born. I was so privileged. I was, I was born in the 1950s that the world was still functioning. <laughs> we didn't realize it was teetering and going off the rails, but at the time it was functioning. I could go outside and see trees lit up with lightning bugs, you know, with fireflies, right? I, I, could, I could go into the streams nearby. And so now, how could I and my generation that contributed to the degradation of the world not to do everything we can now that we know what we have done to create a world that is fertile and verdant and regenerative, right? How could we not do that? And that is indeed our great work. And so I wanted to encourage others to see the world that way and to see that we have this, this great work. Um, and he said one other thing, which I thought also was stunning that we really do not know where other life is on this in this universe, if there is any. And this universe is so grand, so majestic, so mysterious, and it needs a witness. And we, Thomas Berry said, are the witnesses to the majesty of this universe, right? That we are the consciousness of this universe and that we have to take that very seriously as witnesses and we have to protect it. So with those two things, that this is our great work and we are witnesses to the majesty of the universe we, and, and the earth and we cannot contribute to its degradation and to its destruction as we know it, that gets you out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I said, this is what I, I have to de dedicate myself to this and help others dedicate themselves to that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, where my organization is focusing on the Environmental Human Rights Amendment so that it is, it is writ large in our cultural DNA, in our legal DNA, that we all have a right to a healthy environment, each and every one of us. It doesn't make a difference what you're, where you're born, what your zip code is, you know, your wealth, your gender, your race. We all are brought into this world with the same rights to enjoy the fruits of this earth equally. And you can't, right? You can't have economic health without environmental health. You can't have social justice without economic, without environmental justice. They are, we are, if you can't breathe, there is no justice. If you can't have, have clean water, there is no justice, right? And there is no social peace and there is no economic health. That it's all one is so clear. And yet some people still see it as, um, as siloed, as, 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 as segmented, um, and, and it's not. Thank you so much for sharing. That is so insightful and so helpful. I do want to mention um, at this point how the Sierra Club Maryland has been working on an initiative called the Growing for Change Initiative. And what you have just shared 
is so aligned with the work we are trying to do because as we advocate on legislation and as we talk about all our priorities addressing uh, issues like housing and all the things you touched on right now, this is such a important um, perspective to have because we want to make sure we are keeping in mind those that are most impacted by these issues. So thank you again so much for sharing what you did today. Thank and you. Appreciate it. Uh, Rosa, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you, Nina. Um, it's so inspirational and I'm uh, enjoying hearing all of the, you know, hearing uh, via chat all of the responses that people are, are, um, are getting from this event. So I am really pleased to introduce next uh, Ruby Stemmel from Eco Latinos. And I'll mention that when she and I met, we were at another organization's wonderful annual event, the Maryland League of Conservation Voters event in person in Annapolis. And, um, you know, it was back when we could gather in mass numbers. And <laughs> it was a really beautiful event. And I hope to meet again like that someday. And I neglect you to mention in my opening that um, Kristen Harvison will be uh, speaking also a little bit later on after Stacey Hartwell. And so, uh, Ruby, it's so good to see you again, even virtually. And thank you for joining us. And um, your organization, Eco Latinos, has been an inspiration for many people. And um, maybe we'll do another event in Spanish where we can share um, sh share in Spanish. But um, can you uh, can you join us up on screen here and um, introduce Eco Latinos to us? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. You see me now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for, and, and really, honestly, I should be the one to say, oh my gosh, now after this amazing, you know, women that, that we've, you know, got to meet uh, today, just, I am a little bit intimidated because <laughs> we are, um, so we are um, a young orga organization as Ecolatinos. We started Ecolatinos um, years ago. I, I, my personal story, a little bit of that is that I started when, um, when there was a transition of government in um, Maryland. And um, I was working with Governor O'Malley as director of, uh, of the Governor's Commission on Hispanic Affairs and, and, uh, and helping with the governors uh, with appointments, diversifying appointments to boards and commissions back in that, at that time. And uh, for uh, reasons of politics, when there was a transition of government, suddenly I am like, okay, I have no job. <laughs> so at that time, having worked for many years doing Latino outreach, um, not just with the governor, but before in, in Prince George's County where I come, where I live. Um, and, you know, I've been for years doing, you know, outreach to Latinos. So at that time I decided to combine my passion for conservation with my, my history, my background, my, ex my experience doing Latino outreach. And so um, we, um, the, the mission of the organization, so I started originally as a consultant and about, it, I meet, I mean, it's now three years, maybe um, two years, uh, we got nonprofit status. And so we, um, we came with our board together and our mission, you know, define our mission to empower the Latino community in the pursuit of social and environmental justice through engagement, education, and activism across the Chesapeake Bay. And as you all know, Latinos are like other minority groups are more impacted by the hazard, environmental hazards, right? Uh, Latinos are more likely to suffer from water and air, uh, you know, lack of clean water and, and uh, you know, impacted by air pollution, lack of access to green spaces, you know, gardens, fresh food, uh, more likely to live in islands, uh, like heat islands from like lack of trees, no tree canopies, um, a poor quality housing emits more carbon from all heating systems and there is poor insulation that create these, uh, you know, unfortunate situations. 
and put our communities in disadvantage. Um, there is a lack of access in decision making. And so, um, you know, in, in the areas that impact Latinos and definitely, you know, um, the more the the impact of all, all these all these problems creating health issues like uh, you know higher um, incidence of asthma and cancer and neurological diseases and all that. So we um, so we what we do is we advocate of course for social and environmental justice and maybe the slides. The pictures of the slides don't reflect what <laughs> the, the, the title are, but I just tell you about how we do some of these things. Uh, we promote environmental uh, stewardship in the Hispanic community. We through, you know, as I we said in the mission, engagement, education. We um, build partnerships or collaborations with um, church congregations. We go to, you know, we give uh, uh, young students volunteer hours, and we do, you know, our work by engaging people, you know, in 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 environmental work, like through. Uh, tree plantings, um, uh, you know, community cleanups and trainings. So uh, one of the things is that the, the way the way we do our work is is by practicing cultural competence, right? And that means that we go to meet people where they are. Uh, one of the issues with with uh, you know working with minority groups, um, as we all know, is that, um, that we have to. I mean, like. Traditional programs are not designed to, you know, to reach everyone. You know, maybe we, we tend to work too much with a one size fits all. But to work with our communities, we need to design programs that 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 take into account the priorities, the priorities of the community. And that's what we do. So we um, so we develop program. We once we go to the community where the, the the community is, we don't put a poster or a sign or a you know Facebook post and expect people to respond. But we organize the communities by building uh, you know these collaborations and partnerships. That, as I as I mentioned, uh, we can go to the next slide while I keep um, you know mention uh, telling you about us. So. Um, we uh, we do trainings. Um, we like, for example, yesterday we we uh, we had eighty people. <laughs> it, we we put an event where we were um, um, you know present uh, you know, with in a collaboration with the church, and we were working on a particular project where we we're just teaching about you know the best practices that reduce the stormwater runoff. You know, this is one of the things that we got through a grant. And we uh, invited people to come to learn about how uh, you install a rain barrel and how you can, you know, like uh, how uh, does a, a, a rain garden work and uh, all these practices that, that local governments, you know, um, uh, offer for communities to um, you know, benefit through like, you know, rebates and things like that. We got 40 people on, on Zoom and another 40 people showed up. <laughs> so there is a great wow. concern. That to tell you that, that, um, that one of the reasons why, why this work is important is because Latinos studies have found that care as much or even more for environment and for climate change than non-Latinos. Believe it or not, studies show that. Uh, and then Spanish speaking Latinos, according to studies as well, care more about than second generation Latinos, like this one, they knew it Latino. Why? Maybe because we are people that come from um, um, and out in many of the communities that, that the immigrant communities come from the farming, come from living by the, you know, by, by, by the seeds they plant and, and the food they harvest. 
And so the, it's that, that natural connection and also, you know, mm -hmm. the spiritual connection in these communities makes it la Latino the best partner for environmental work. And we know that there are so many resources in the environmental movement and not, they don't reach, uh, um, you know, the minority groups and underserved communities because um, they are not designed to, 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 to reach, to, to connect. They are, again, uh, traditionally designed to, for the general community, but this, our communities require a little bit of cultural competence, the cultural sensitivities that we design the program in a way that the community understand it. And, and, and the community wants to be involved with it. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that we, you know, we have the, this, this, uh, uh, this year with the, last year with the pandemic, we had to pivot a little bit, being culturally sensitive with the COVID, having impacted communities so strongly. So we had to, we switched the environmental message to a more sensitive to the needs of the community. So that is basically aligning our programs to community priorities as part of, to, to uh, you know, um, creating uh, programs that are culturally sensitive. And um, so, yeah, that's basically what we do. Um, I don't know uh, if there is any questions mm -hmm. uh, about that, just, um, I just wanted, you know, I'll prepare just to share what we do here. And uh, I am so honored and excited to be with you tonight. And, uh, and you know, you wanna work with Latinos, reach with Latinos. We do every, all our work in Spanish. We, we our communities, the communities that we work with are the communities that speak mostly Spanish. The, the pro program that we did yesterday, was all in Espanol, for example. And we had 80 people there in both. So it's been, you know, pretty amazing, empowering, inspiring. I didn't think that after all these years that I've been doing this, I would be still working as hard as I am, so passionate about it, but the community is inspiring. And that's really been an amazing experience for me. And yeah. thank you for having me. Oh, of course, of course. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, you know, it, you, you've, um, you've said it so well, you know, I, I don't think that, um, that it, it's so inspiring to hear the, the way um, that you're engaging. And I see that um, folks are asking for your info. They want to know how to support you. So if you want to put your information in the chat and, and uh, we really encourage um, I mean, this is wonderful community engagement and, uh, to, you know, the message of meeting people where they're at, I think, is so um, is so powerful and, and something to really, you know, that to sit on um, and um, and also for dispelling some of the common myths and misconceptions that people hold um, about uh, about the community so that um, we can be more effective in, in collaborating and, and working together. Um, Thank you so much. I really, yeah. So we, I'll, I'll put the, you know, my website there, um, www.articolatinos.org, and uh, and you know my my number also. But you know, we'll be happy. This is the one thing that I that that, that we do is that we help organizations that have the environmental programs that um, that are and at this time where everybody's trying to, you know do you know um, do the work in a way that is inclusive right and that uh, diversity is right now the thing in the environmental movement that we are all talking about right and so what we are offering is to help you build that bridge so uh, you know um, some organizations are challenged with the not having the staff, not having, you know, often you hear I said I don't have anybody who speaks Spanish and I don't have anybody in my budget you know what, next time you have a vacancy in your organization, it, no matter what, you, you don't have to get a funding for a job that uh, says a Latino, a person who speaks Spanish, your accountant, you know, anybody in your organization that speaks Spanish will be somebody at your table that can 
tell you how to and, and that can bring the voice of our community to your organization. So, uh, and there are many more, many more, more ways. I'll be happy to talk to you if you give me a call and send me an email. I put my information in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, turn over the program back to Shruti and um, thank you all for, for staying on. I think this has been such an inspiring evening and I hope that you don't mind that we're going a little bit over because this is so fun to engage and get a little deeper um, with everyone. Totally agree with you. Thank you everyone for staying on and uh, I really want to just say Ruby you were so on spot with it as an immigrant who's come from Indian, who's Indian American, I totally relate to what you are saying and how important it is for us to engage those that come from diverse communities. Well, it is my pleasure now to introduce our next guest, Alish Hopper, who is an American poet, writer, and teacher. Uh, she released a chapbook titled Bird in the Head in 2005 and has since published a poetry called Dark Sky Society, which explores racial tensions. Alish teaches classes in writing and poetry, social and emergent practices, and new narrative practices or cultural rewriting. Her work is crucially informed by growing up white in then mostly black DC and by being the daughter of an immigrant from Ireland. So without further ado, Alish, I want to call on you and I know that I'm very, I'm excited. I know you're going to share a beautiful poem with us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you for including me. And um, I agree with all the chat is just on fire um, with with appreciation for everyone who's been speaking today. And I, I just want to add my voice to that. It's just inspiring um, to hear about what everyone's been up to. Um, I'm, I'm reading a poem from this anthology, which if you're if you don't know it and don't have it, I highly recommend it. It's called All We Can Save. And um, it's uh, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson's edited collection. It's visionary, it's inspiring, um, it's essays, and they graciously included poets. Um, and I, I would say, you know, wisely included poets. Um, the, the one thing I want to say before I read uh, the poem that they selected is just that um, I've been working as an organizer for probably close to three decades and have reflected a lot about um, the ways that it often seems like we circle back to the same thing and um, and really had pondered, before I read this poem, pondered a lot about the ways that degradation of the planet or degradation of um, our, our communities and, and injustices in human society. Um, for me, um, Sometimes that's the, the, the background and, and the real story is relationship. So this is called, did it ever occur to you that maybe you're falling in love? We buried the problem. We planted a tree over the problem. We regretted our actions toward the problem. We declined to comment on the problem. We carved a memorial to the problem, dedicated it, but forgot our handkerchief. We removed all unnatural ingredients, handcrafted a locally grown tincture for the problem, but nobody bought it. We freshly laundered, bleached, deodorized the problem. We built a wall around the problem, tagged it with pictures of children, birds, and trees. We renamed the problem and denounced those who used the old name. We wrote a law for the problem, but it died in committee. We drove the problem out with loud noises from homemade instruments. We marched, leafleted, sang hymns, linked arms with the problem, got dragged to jail, got spat on by the problem and let out. We elected an official who finally gets the problem. We raised an army to corral and question the problem. They went door to door, but could never ID. We made www.problem.com so you can find out about the problem and www.problem.org so you can help. We created 1-800-PROBLEM so you could report on the problem and 1-900-PROBLEM so you could be the only daddy that really turns that problem on. We drove the wheels off of that problem. We rocked the shit out of that problem. We amplified the problem, turned it on up and blew it out. We drank to forget the problem. We inhaled the problem, exhaled the problem, crushed its ember under our shoe. We 
put a title on the problem, took out all the articles, conjunctions, and verbs, called it experimental problem. We shot the problem and put it out of its misery. We swallowed daily pills for the problem, followed a problem fast, drank problem tea. We read daily problem horoscopes, had a problem poems read by a seer. We prayed. Burned problem incense, formed a problem task force, got a problem degree, got on the problem tenure track, got a problem retirement plan. We gutted and renovated the problem. We joined the Neighborhood Problem Development Corps. We listened and communicated with the problem only to find out it had gone for the day. We mutually empowered the problem. We kissed and stroked the problem. We fucked the problem all night, woke up to an empty bed. We watched carefully for the problem, but our flashlight died. We had dreams of the problem in which we could no longer recognize ourselves. We reformed, we transformed, we turned over a new leaf, turned a corner, found ourselves near a scent that somehow reminded us of the problem in ways we could never put into words that little I can't explain it, that makes it hard to think, that rings like a siren inside. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful poem, Arish, and we really appreciate you sharing it with us and you shared it so beautifully. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I pass it on back to you, Rosa. Wow. Um, thank you so much. That was incredible. And I see I see all of the, the excitement out there. I, I was captivated. Um, so next and, and, um, and ending our, our program, um, our wonderful Stacy Hartwell, um, who is joining us in, oh, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody. Um, Stacy Hartwell, the NAACP Maryland State Conference Co-Chair for Environmental and Climate Justice is here to chat with us this evening. And thank you, uh, thank you everyone for staying on and, uh, and just enjoying, I'm, I can't tell you how much it means to like, be here virtually with all of you one year later. This is really wonderful. Thanks so much, Rosa. Um, before I get started, is it Eilish or Eilish? I just want to give you a crazy shout out, girlfriend. You were rocking that problem. And it was just really beautiful. I really enjoyed that. And I'm definitely going to get the book because I'm going to share that with other people. Good evening, sisters um, and friends. Um, the first thing I would like to say, and I'm not, I promised um, Rose I would not take a lot of time because I know we're like over time, is that when I came to the NAACP two years ago, I came with a passion for addressing a problem. And if you can't be um, a part of the solution, don't be a part of the problem. I am committed to help people who are not empowered to help themselves. I bring a tremendous amount of talent and resources available for us to reach out to our frontline and fence line communities. I have engaged our 24 branches that we have around the state to say, hey, look, let's let's help those that who can't help themselves. And to whom much is given, you know, much is expected. I have been gifted. I have been blessed as Rabbi Cardin has shared. I grew up at a time where we used to pick fresh green beans from my grandma's garden and have a, a walk at home at night just by the light of the moon um, and just stay outside all night and not have to worry about a lot of the ills that plague us now. So for for me to have that experience, I really work to so that my grandchildren can have that experience and that other children in blighted communities can have that experience. So I am impassioned because I care. I'm, I am empowered because I look across this Zoom and I see faces of people that I have come to call not only friends, we are 
warriors together. We are not just woke, we are warriors. And I look at your faces and I know the work that you have done. I'm not gonna call out any names because I don't wanna leave anyone out. You all are doing amazing stuff. I've touched some of you all virtually and I will continue to, um, to, to look and to amplify your voice. Um, I'm just here tonight to share that the NAACP is engaged, as you well know, in civil rights um, at, um, activism, you know, for, for almost a for over a century now. The work that we're doing now um, in Maryland is focused on educating our community and helping uplift people. We currently have, and this is just a shameless plug, but I've got to get it out there. We're giving scholarships to students at Maryland um, HBCUs to attend solar, um, solar careers training. The um, training is for two days. It has a value of $1,600, but we are giving this training out to students at no cost. The deadline for them to apply for this training is March 31st. The training is for two days. It also includes um, a solar collegiate conference, a nationwide conference that we're paying for, for students to attend. So if you know of anyone, please copy this from the chat and share it widely. Again, it's for um, Maryland HBCU students. Um, that's really all I want to say. But before I go tonight, I want to thank Rosa ever so much. She is like a God sister, an earth sister who <laughs> reaches out out to me and includes me <laughs> in the work that we're doing. Um, and to all of you um, beautiful women that I see on this call, it is a pleasure knowing you, knowing of you. And if there's anything I can ever do to uplift your work or to, to amplify your voice, by all means, please reach out to me. Thank you all ever so much and you know, happy spring. Yes, thank you, Stacy. happy spring. And it's always so much fun to work with you. I, um, this is such a blast. So before we close, um, and, and Spice is going to sing us out with a song, I was thinking we would have like a few extra minutes where we could stay on and chit chat like we would if we were at a, you know, a, a cocktail hour with our tea or our wine or something. Um, and so if anyone does want to stay on afterwards, I, I still will be happy to chat with any of you who are on. Um, Feel free in the chat. Keep sharing the the messages. I don't know. This is such a long chat. We could write a we could write another book on it. Um, we'll try to get everyone connected afterwards as well. Um, and and before I go, we had such a wonderful opening slideshow in the beginning. You will of course be getting it um, afterwards. And I wanted to share if, if anyone in, from the first part of the slide wanted to say a few words in closing, um, because we're so grateful that you're here and to honor you, um, Kristen Harbison or anyone else who is out there that I see here on the Zoom that hasn't um, gotten a chance to, to say hi, um, give me a wave and let me know if you wanna say hi and, um, and then we'll, we'll close with the song. All right, well, thank you. I think um, this has been such a wonderful evening and I'm sure that there are lots of um, there are lots of calls to action here, but I think you already know them all um, in in the chat. Oh, good. Um, I'll let uh, I'll let Lindsay say um, say a few words. Lindsay Mendelson is our wonderful transportation campaign staff person and friend uh, who <laughs> came all the way down to Southern Maryland to do an event with us. Um, so, Lindsay, take it away. Yes, hello um, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I was just, it was so wonderful and beautiful to hear from everyone today um, and just echoing the inspiration. Um, I just look up to all of you so much and it's just so wonderful to see so many kick-ass women doing so many wonderful things in the world. So just wanted to thank you. Um, and I, I don't know if I uh, introduce myself, um, Lindsay Mendelson, she, her pronouns, I'm the transportation representative. And thank you so much to everyone for putting this program together, especially Rosa and Shruti. We'll have to do this again next year. I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling I'm feeling like this is really good for my soul and and I and I hope that we can um, we can keep this up I think. Um, so thank you Lindsay and thank you everyone and um, without further ado Spice are you ready to sing us out? Sure I am. You have been wonderful yeah. <laughs> I was gonna sing the battle hymn of women but I think I'm gonna go back to Ella's song because Bernice Johnson Reagan, who started Sweet Honey in the Rock many years ago and was a, a SNCC singer and activist, um, 
I actually helped teach her son how to sail at a camp once, but um, she wrote this song for Ella, Ella Baker, who was a um, activist. And I really believe it's women of colors time. And, you know, I am a Jewish American woman whose mother escaped Germany. And I have so much feeling for, for my sisters of color and for what people have gone through. I can hide, I can hide the fact that I'm Jewish. Um, you cannot hide the fact that you are beautiful, colorful women who have suffered so much. And, you know, women are going to save the world if anyone can. And feel free to mute and sing along. We, uh, let me, uh, wait a minute. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mother's son is as important as a killing a white man, white mother's son. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That which touches me most is that I have a chance to work with people passing on to others that which was passed on to me. To me, young people come first, they come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I can but shed some light as they carry us through the gale. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. The older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. Not needing to clutch for power, not needing for the light just to shine on me. I need to be one in a number as we fight against tyranny. Well, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Ow, ow. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I have come to realize that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way I struggle survives. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice and I must be heard. Sometimes I can be quite difficult about down in no man's word. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Yes. Oh, Spice. Thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful way to end our um, end our program, and I thank you um, so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person sometime, hopefully in 2021. 
Um, we're hopeful. Usually we have our jamboree and annual celebration bringing people together. We camp, we have lodges, try to make everything accessible and um, spend some time together outdoors. And I hope we can do that this year and to see you all there. Um, so thank you all for coming. And I understand it's past some folks' bedtimes. And <laughs> so if you have to run, I understand. But um, we can unmute yeah. and cheer. Unmute yeah. and cheer. <laughs> we're badass women doing the work. Doing the work. Badass women doing the work. 